In the early days of agile estimation and planning, planning poker was done with t-shirt sizes. T-shirt sizes such as extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, even double XL, were used to determine the relative size of a feature against a baseline. While this is a very effective way of decoupling time from a feature's level of effort, similar, of course, to the Macintosh and M&Ms that I explained just a few minutes ago, it wasn't the most efficient way to assign story points for a particular user story. Story points are quite important when we look at things like team velocity and the product backlog and the re-estimation that we'll look at later on in this module. As planning poker evolved, Mike Cohn, a popular book author and agile practitioner, started to assign numerical values to the planning poker cards. What Mike Cohn did was start using a Fibonacci sequence in order to differentiate the sizes. What I mean by that is it's very easy to tell the difference between a 1 and a 2, but how easy is it to tell the difference between, let's say, a 15 and a 16. So planning poker cards now commonly have numerical values and those numerical values are the level of effort compared to the baseline. So how does planning poker work? The way planning poker works is to get the entire team together, usually done in person, around the table. They're each given a set of planning poker cards with the numerical values on them and then the facilitator will read out the user story. And everyone then will hold up their card without showing everyone else their card. After the user story is read and everyone has a chance to think about it, everyone will show their cards. What usually happens at this point is everyone is pretty far apart. Planning poker is then used to facilitate a discussion over why people chose their levels of effort. For example, if we go back to the story where you thought it was a 2 for a particular user story and I thought it was a 20, in the very beginning you may have been intimidated and actually chose a 15 or a 16 just to really keep yourself in line with me and a conversation never would have happened. But by using planning poker, I had no chance to intimidate you and I put down my 20 and you put down your 2 and now it's time to actually talk about why you thought it was something that was an easy effort and why I thought it was something that was a very difficult effort. A lot of times what will happen next is if the team cannot agree very quickly they'll do a planning poker session a second time. What will happen after the second time people will usually be much closer together. If you're, very, if you're further apart or still very far apart, it may make sense to put that user story aside and do a different user story and get consensus on those user stories before you actually go ahead and vote on that one. The way planning poker works is to get the entire team that will be implementing the system together, preferably in the same location around a physical table. Then you'll have a facilitator read the user stories and everyone will be given a deck of planning poker cards. The deck of planning poker cards will have the numerical values and remember those numerical values will equate to the amount of difficulty this user story will be compared to the baseline. So the way planning poker will work is the facilitator will read the user story and each person at the table will hold their card and not let anyone know what the card says. After being given amount of time to think about the user story, everyone will put their planning poker card down on the table. What this does is you will see the range of values that everyone has put down. For example, a tester might have put down a 2 for this user story, but the developers might have put down a 20 or a 30 because they didn't understand the user story itself. So what will happen is the range, if it's very far apart, will be used as an opportunity to facilitate a conversation about that user story and about the levels of effort. What will happen is if the team is very far apart, after the discussion, it makes sense to have a second vote. This time, the vote will be done and hopefully the team will be much closer together. 
if the team is much close together but can't come to an exact value, a lot of teams will just take an average. However, if the team is very far apart, what will happen is an average will not really be that accurate. So the advice that I would give you is if the team still remains very far apart after two votes, is not to go through this again and vote a third time, because chances are you'll still be quite far apart. Rather, I would say put that particular user story aside and do one or two other user stories and see if you have consensus on those user stories. If you do, that means the team is pretty much well understanding each other in those stories and the story where you are very far apart becomes an outlier. And then you may want to discuss that with the business or the product owner or even discuss it a little further after you've done a couple other user stories. However, if you do further user stories and those user stories are quite far apart, the team is probably not understanding the exercise or not understanding the roles and the way that you vote. If this happens, it may make sense to actually start again and have a facilitator explain the rules of planning poker and understand that you're voting on the entire effort it will take for that iteration. That means the design, the coding, all the architecture and testing of that particular feature. A lot of times it's just a misunderstanding of the level of effort. Lastly, it's important to remember that planning poker is a tool to facilitate a safe discussion in order to build consensus. If remember in the previous example when I was talking about how I was a dominating personality and I was intimidating other people, planning poker takes that intimidation level away because I'm, I have the opportunity to vote on a particular feature without actually being influenced by other people. Planning poker doesn't necessarily solve the intimidation problem, but it really mitigates it quite well. Planning poker also gives us the ability to set our anchors, and sometimes we're not going to be able to meet in the middle because we're so far apart, it actually forces us to have a conversation as opposed to start negotiating our positions. So you can see, planning poker has its roots in negotiation theory, and planning poker is a great facility to start estimating your projects and assign story points to user stories. Planning poker is not easy to do if you've never done it before. So the first time you do planning poker, sometimes it's a little difficult. So I thought it'd be fun to include a couple quotes from the real world from planning poker sessions that I've participated in over the course of the years. These are some of the most memorable quotes because they stick out on my mind to remind me that planning poker is, always, is not always that simple. A great example is, I remember once someone telling me, how did I go from a 20 to a two on my second vote? A very common thing is when we are negotiating, sometimes people get frustrated. And I remember someone who, had a, who was in a position of authority yelling and banging on the table saying, let's do it again, hoping that their process of intimidation worked and everyone would vote with them the second time around. I remember once when I was arguing, and I was guilty of arguing positions, not interests, I was arguing with a colleague. And that colleague said to me, do you want me to take the card back? I actually, to this day, don't know if that colleague was being sarcastic or being genuine. Luckily, we did work that one out. And I remember after a particular planning poker session where we voted the first time and we were, you know, we were far apart enough that we decided to vote a second time. And then someone, I think it was the facilitator, who said, the second time we're supposed to be closer, not further apart because after our discussions, we became really far apart. So as you can see, planning poker is not perfect. Planning poker will not really be the solution to your problems when you come to getting a good estimate. However, planning poker will be used, as I said, to facilitate the conversation and avoid the problem of the dominating personality. Before we move on to the next section of the module, I think it's important just to take a second and summarize what we've learned so far. By putting our requirements into user stories, we can use the facility of planning poker to assign story points to those user stories. And planning poker is very interesting because it's a consensus-driven approach to estimating how many story points go for each user story. 
as opposed to arguing or having one person dominate that particular conversation. It's also a way to counter the tendency of always meeting in the middle. By using planning poker, people don't know what those first votes are or what those anchors are going to be. So it really provides a facility for that conversation. As I said before, the entire team plays. And if the entire team can't be physically in one place, there are websites, a popular one called planningpoker.com, that you can use to facilitate the planning poker session without everyone physically being in the same place. Lastly, it's important to remember that you are estimating the entire effort, not just the effort to code, not just the effort to test, not just the effort to design or architect the particular user story. So that's why sometimes planning poker takes a few rounds for the team to get used to what the level of effort will be. In general, you're only going to do planning poker for two, maybe three rounds, and then you need to start thinking of another facility.